Hello there, I'm David Staples from the Edmonton Journal, and I'm here today with Dave Breckenridge, Managing Editor of the Edmonton Journal. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, David. And we're here to talk about the top 10 tweets from Alberta and around the world. And, the, mm -hmm. and actually, these are tweets that have caught our interest from the internet, and I'm doing kind of a, <clears throat> usually a daily post, although I took the weekend off and just put them all together into one post. Um, looking at public opinion from around the world, and Dave, I've found it really, really interesting over time. Um, just, just kind of some of the themes that I'm seeing from the tweets, um, mm -hmm. in, the, in the wide variety of uh, approaches, the differences of, of opinion, um, uh, the the different fights going on in different countries. It's been fascinating. So yeah, uh, it's been a very interesting uh, exercise. All right, let's start. What is, what tweet uh, first caught your eye, Dave? Um, you know. Out of all of this, I'm trying to keep a positive head about me. I'm mm. trying to, you know, remain positive. Some of these issues that people are dealing with are frustrating. And so one thing that I notice, I, I kind of see myself paying a lot of attention to on social media is positive messaging from people. And so the first one that that I noticed in your list was from U.S. writer Lisa at Lisa for mama for mama at Lisa underscore for mama. Uh, you know what's not canceled? Love, relationships, reading, family bonding, talking, movie night, character, integrity, honesty, decency, space, time, friendship, hope, faith, compassion, peace. Spread it around. It's contagious. I mean, in the cesspool of social media that, you know, that you don't always see all of those things, but it is one of those <laughs> those things that I think that uh, kind of catch my eye and I try to remain positive even when my, you know, my kids don't want to do their schoolwork and and all that. So that's I, that's what caught my eye. And it's good messaging that, like, you know, it's a great time to reconnect with family or to just slow down, spend more time with family, relax, not stress. So I'm trying to hang on to stuff like that. And hard to do that because it is a very, very stressful time for people. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a different time for students, you know. Um, you know, but, you know, some they are continue, continuing on as best they can with schoolwork. In, in fact, to do this podcast, I podcast i had to interrupt my son who was talking with another friend about their physics i think it's physics homework um and they were working like hour on end on the away on their uh, homework so so good mm -hmm. for you know lots of lots of people are buckling down although i have also seen concerns from uh, educators about a whole group of kids uh, students that aren't um that for whatever reason that's not going on in their lives right now and they're they're totally mm -hmm um getting behind so it's a it's a very different experience for everyone and a, and um as i said a stressful one i'll i'll on that same looking looking for the positive this is from the uh, founder of spartan race i don't know what spartan race is dave but i don't think uh we, i don't think i'm up for it it's i think it's when they're long and you run <clears throat> through mud and you climb over stuff and it just seems like too much effort for me slay persians <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's what the Spartans did. That's not that's a, true. Very any true. other kind of comment, but that's a historical comment rooted in historical reality. They slayed everybody, of course. Greeks, you know, they were uh, great warriors. Okay, this is yeah. from founder of Spartan Race, Joe DeSena, and real Joe DeSena. And he says, when you're old and look back at this time in history, you can say, I was on the couch doing nothing the whole quarantine, or... I read, I learned, I exercised, I was productive. So um, this you is- You and I uh, worked. That's, we, we'll look back and say, <laughs> we worked a lot. <laughs> I'm starting to exercise again though. Cause I like, well, I was putting on weight uh, yeah. at a kind of an alarming rate I found. And I just realized, I know how this goes. It, it either goes in one direction or the other. So I better start going in the other direction. So I have actually have really, so what I'm doing is um, I'm, I uh, have some barbells here and I set the timer for like every hour or two hours. And when the alarm goes off, I, I do a short little workout just to get out of my chair, uh, mm -hmm. you know, five, 10 times a day and, and do something. Right on. But what's your next one? I, it's from Globe and Mail writer, mm -hmm. Adam Radwanski uh, at a Radwanski on a personal note, having spent the last week looking at various uncertainties around how society could reopen the thing i most want to know now is when my kid will be able to play with another kid again as a parent i can relate you know my son and my daughter 
they get along well enough, but they're not like super best friend kind of siblings. So I know my daughter would love to go hang out with her friends. My son would love to hang out with his friends. Um, and yeah, I think that that's for me, it's kind of like, well, when can they, you know, we're going to have to start organizing some socially distanced bike rides or something. I don't know. Don't send the police after me folks. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's a touchy time. Got to be careful yes. what you say. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's a really hard time for kids. I walked by a playground the other day and there's a sign on it. Like you can't go in there and use it. It's just like, wow. Mm -hmm. All right. This is from uh, Chris O'Dowd at big boiler. And I think he's a comedian, but I'm not sure. <clears throat> and he said, um, quote, our youngest son just called the Netflix logo daddy. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. We're trying to avoid streaming. Uh -huh. You know, we have school going, we have, we, I mean, obviously we use Netflix and the, and streaming services, but the amount, we're trying to limit the amount that we do just so that the internet doesn't run too slowly in our house. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we got everyone on the internet here as well. And, mm -hmm. uh, no one's really watching a whole lot of TV though. Everyone's just on their computers doing their own thing. Probably maybe they're yeah. watching it on there. Okay. My next one. Oh, it's your turn. Go ahead. Mine is uh, Canadian citizen Astrid K uh, hash, uh, at Little Red Ace. Took my dogs for a run this morning because the last thing I need in my life is two bored Malamutes full of energy destroying my home and yard. And some effing Karen screamed at me from her porch that she was calling the cops. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it is one of those things. It, thankfully, I've heard, I've heard stories about people who've gone out in, in other parts of the country and been harassed by bylaw officers or police officers. And thankfully, on, on any of my walks, none of the people in my neighborhood have turned to me and said, uh, why are you out? But I'd have some choice words for them should someone ever suggest that I should go home or they're going to call the police on me. Well, there's it's I think it's I think it's categorically insane to say people can't go for <laughs> walks on their own. Right. You, you are allowed to go for a walk on your own now. But that said, I've had some insane reactions hostile reactions which i'm not proud of myself like to to people cycling by or joggers coming by like i i like i just feel like and, and it's probably uh because i've read some false scientific report on the internet like that uh, i think that was the you know they they project all this stuff and i i don't know if, i think it was proven to be not true not accurate although i don't know so mm -hmm. I, i've had these this feelings of hostility that you know on the other hand you know we've got to get out into the sun you know hopefully in a, well, in a socially distanced way for the, for the near future. But there's, there should be nothing from all kinds of people getting out and walking. And when I went out in Edmonton, I went out for a walk on Saturday with my wife mm -hmm. and this, it, the city was full of people out enjoying the day. Yeah. I, I have to say not one of them. I didn't see one person wearing a mask, but I, and that's the truth. Not one person of the hundreds and hundreds of people I saw, but I thought I saw just about everybody was socially distancing. Well, that's so good. that's that's kind of where we're at. Seems like in Edmonton, yeah. in terms of like we're speaking with our feet, Dave, in, in terms of what we're <laughs> going to to do and put up with. Yeah, this is and this is this relates to this. So this is from South Punjab resident Maiza Hamid Garage, and uh, one of the great things about Twitter is you can read like what's going on around the world, and we're all dealing with this. Every citizen on Earth, it seems, and mm -hmm. her tweet is: there is a certain unique and strange delight about walking down an empty street alone. And uh, maybe, like, I don't, I, I, I think, I'm guessing that the South Punjab is probably, like, not, has a bit more population density than we do here. Yeah. <laughs> and and how, how strange, I, I've not been there. <clears throat> but I know the population numbers for uh, density numbers, generally speaking, for India and Canada. Although I understand there's places in India that are, have, uh, low density but they're usually in the north um that must be so weird if you're from this hugely packed crammed city to to go for a walk and, and experience mm -hmm. that yeah. it, i haven't experienced it much here there seems to be quite a few people on the street um when i when i go out i haven't had that empty street feeling in edmonton yet have you no i i mean but i've kind of kept where i've been pretty limited. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I had to drive into the office to pick up some gear and downtown was kind of quiet, but the <laughs> roads around the city weren't 
quiet at all. And then, you know, I, on my trips to the grocery store around my neighborhood, there's people out and about. Like, so it's not super quiet where I'm at, but it's not busier than normal either, I guess. It just kind of feels like a weekend. Every day feels like a Saturday. Everyone's home. You can hear people outside through parts of the day. Um, and especially now that it's warm outside. All right. My next, my next one is, uh, Toronto political analyst, Warren Kinsella at Kinsella Warren. Is it wrong that I am grateful that the circus that is question period isn't happening during the pandemic? I know there's been a lot of debate about whether parliament should sit, whether they shouldn't sit, whether the prime minister's daily press briefings are a good enough, uh, bit of accountability for the government, things of that nature. Um, personally, I like watching question period, but I like the theater of it all, but that's what it is. It's theater. And, and Kinsella is kind of right that, you know, not having that spectacle every day, um, might actually be a good thing. Canadians may be less cynical about politics if they're not seeing daily clips of the thrust and parry from the house of commons. Uh, and they're more seeing people trying to compromise or communicate with one another, um, the work has to get done, obviously. Like they're, they're, I know that they're doing some committee meetings <clears> online and there's debate about whether House of Commons should come back. But question period kind of feels like extraneous at this point. Yeah, I, I could see once. Like I, I liked it when the Alberta legislature has met. And, mm -hmm. and it's funny because of the politics of people. Like, like so the cons there hasn't been much of a debate in Alberta because we, Kenny has generally, like the, they've kept it open. They've had a few sessions. Mm-hmm. But um, I just, I, I'd like to see one one day a week, maybe in Ottawa. I don't know if that makes sense that or makes not, sense, or two, yeah. two days a week. Like, I think opposition is important because we're going to, we're going to have a really difficult and painful debate going forward. And I can see that having written a column about it, that it like enraged a lot of people, like, but a lot of people agreed with me as well. Like, we, it's time to start talking about opening up and looking at other countries and, Man, people have such different reactions to that, and it's such a fraught issue. We need our politicians in public to start having that discussion, I think, as mm -hmm. difficult as it is, and to for both sides, all sides. I'd like to hear what the NDP has to say about opening up. I see a lot of criticism of, for instance, the Kenny government, which is fine. That's their job. But what is their plan? Do they have a plan, or is it... Is it so? And I'd like to see from the Conservatives, in federal Conservatives and the federal Liberals, so they, mm -hmm. we need to know, we need to have this debate and it's a, it's going to be hard. So, and I think that the question period will help with that. Mm -hmm. My next one is from, where am I now? Oh, Toronto podcaster and activist, Nora Loretto at Norlo, no, at No Lore. And uh, so she's, she's a very well-known activist because she takes extremely unpopular positions now and then, but she's a real fighter for her, yeah. her causes, which is social justice. And she's uh, <clears throat> she's done everyone a real service here because she's put together a spreadsheet on all of the uh, um, problems at, at extended care facilities and uh, seniors places. Mm -hmm. And you can go uh, go to her Twitter feed and you can find that spreadsheet. So she, across Canada, she's like, so she's how many people there are the cases, who owns it? Really interesting information, whether they're public or private. And anyway, but this tweet isn't about that. It's just about her comment on the situation. And she says, quote, the most bizarre thing about living through this crisis is how differently we experience it. Healthcare professionals versus grocery clerks versus sitting at home doing nothing versus families of infected ones versus those who have the virus and those in the ICU versus those who died, unquote. Mm -hmm. No truer words. And, and what I'm, I, I'm finding two huge divides. Um, and, it, and it has to do with the... One of them, I, I think everyone feels some risk, but to the extent that you feel personal risk or like real risk for of someone really close to you, you feel one way about it. To the extent that that's less of an issue for you, you tend to feel another. Yeah. I see those two camps developing. And the other one, the other one that's as huge is if you feel confident you have a, a job after this, like you, you know, you're you're in one of those professions where you're just going to have a job after it because there's going to be, you know, firefighters, police officers, teachers, doctors, nurses, all those jobs. If you feel confident, as opposed to those who don't feel confident, they're going to have a job after it. That's another huge divide. Mm -hmm. It's uh, that, so there's it's breaking down a lot. And so it's it's and it's funny because those in one the, the the jobs thing 
It doesn't really break down along political lines because there's a lot of people who have real health problems who might be on the left or the right of the political perspective. Yeah. So it's a it's a fascinating debate debate in that way. But I see that divide right now. Yeah, it's true. Um, for my last one, and this this comes with a bit of detail. I'm gonna you know. Mm -hmm. uh gonna have to look at a couple numbers here but this is from toronto sun columnist brian Lilly, and he has a link to his column um but the tweet is in the battle over whether to start reopening the society there are two polls from john wright live and angus reed show that the public simply isn't ready no politician would go against public opinion this strong and i think this is interesting because there's a huge debate in the states and there are near riots of people trying to storm state houses and, and you know in state capitals demanding the economy get reopened i don't think we're there yet in canada and even in places like alberta which may be less trusting of the federal government and some of these measures everyone like a, a solid majority in every region of the country basically says it's too soon to start lifting public re public restrictions imposed since the covid 19 outbreak in my province so that, that was the, which is closest to your point of view. And that was one of the options. And the national number is 77% say it's too soon to start lifting public res restrictions. BC is in line with the national average. Um, Saskatchewan is about 72%. Alberta and Quebec are the, like the outliers on the low end, 69% in Alberta and 67% in Quebec. But those are still solid majorities, more than two thirds. In Ontario, it jumps up to 84%. And in the. Now, to get a little further down into the numbers, the question is well, when? When do people feel it might be appropriate yeah, so to start opening up? Before July 1st, Dave, what's the numbers? What's the national. Like, how? what percentage of Canadians before July 1st say we should open up? It's 61, per, 61%, according to Angus Reid. So, a few weeks. So, the, the question is when do you think your own provincial government should start lifting restrictions on businesses, institutions, and places that have been closed since the outbreak began a few weeks, like late April. Yeah. 15% nationally yeah. up to 23% in Alberta and 30% in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Okay. Um, Alberta is at 23, Quebec's at 19. So a little, a little more variance between the provinces for late April. A month or two, as in May or June, the national average is 46%. Pretty much everyone across the country, every province is in line with that, pretty much. 48% in BC, 46% in Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, 45 in Ontario, 50 in Quebec, and 43 in Atlantic Canada. So in Alberta, the number you get up to 69% who want to see restrictions lifted before Canada Day. In Alberta, it's 61%. So we're a little higher than the national average. When you go down to further out, Ontario, a third of Ontarians would like to see between July and October, say between July and October would be okay. In Atlanta, Canada, it's about 32%. But other than that, you know, you're down to below 10% really. With the exception of BC and Atlanta, Canada, after October or not until a vaccine develops, you're talking about less than 10% of the population. So there is an appetite on the part of Canadians Though no one is ready now, or a very small number of people are ready now, there is public opinion that says we want to see this discussed and we potentially want to see restrictions lifted by Canada Day. Whether that's possible is another story, but that's where the, <clears throat> the common thinking is at this point. And, and I think and that's really interesting to see. Is the majority before July, June 1st, if you add up May and uh, right now numbers together? It, they don't break that down. They okay. say... The the breakdown is the options that people were given were a few weeks, as in late April, yeah, uh, a month or two, May oh, slash June, okay. three to six months, July and October, after October, and not until the vaccine is developed. So we don't have a before <clears throat> June right now. Um, so there is, I mean, this isn't Angus Reid, obviously a, a, a long-standing, well-respected uh, public opinion firm. Um, these seem like pretty solid numbers, but it, it, it is interesting to see that while there are some variances regionally, uh, for the most part, Canadians seem to be in lockstep with one another on a, it's too soon right now. And B probably not, you know, it'd be good before Canada day, but probably a month or two before we would want to see restrictions lifted. Yeah. Um, 
this is it. I did a poll myself last week on Twitter and I have more than mm-hmm. 5,000 people respond to it. And you always wonder, right, when you do a Twitter poll, you know, what, what does that really tell you? Because you, you have your own followers who, who tend to, you know, think what you might think in general, you know, not always. But yeah. it also had a ton of people who retweeted it. Mm-hmm. Um, so it had 5,000 is a pretty large sample size for any poll. And the numbers that I found, and I didn't even ask about opening right now because I didn't think that anyone <laughs> Actually, I didn't think anyone, but I'm surprised there's that many that want to open right now. I'm not surprised that there's some. But anyway, I asked for May and June, and the total was 65% of the people. 45% May, 20% June. So 65% in my poll, Twitter poll, before um, July 1st. So that's very much in line with the Alberta numbers. It's a little lower than the Alberta numbers that Agus Reid found. And I, and I think maybe because um, most of my followers are probably in Edmonton, and might have a slightly different take on than, than the average Albertan. So, so yeah, there seems to be, you know, about two thirds of people, let's say two thirds of Canadians in May and June, they're looking mm-hmm. for, they're looking for movement. And yeah. I, I think that's completely reasonable position. I actually think uh, Dr. Hinshaw and Jason Kenney are going to be very, uh, f- for people on the right, who, and it's generally speaking, people on the right, I've noticed like uh, who want it to open fast. Yeah, I think I think they're going to be frustrated with Kenny. I think he's going to move slower, uh, and Hinshaw are going to move slower than uh, a lot of people will want. But I see them both as on this point uh, prudent, and mm-hmm. they will err on the side of caution. So, like it or not, you, you're not living in Sweden, folks. Sweden's yeah. <laughs> it's funny. The Sweden. This is the one so time Alberta s- wants to live in Sweden, right? The so-called socialist haven of sweden <laughs> is the is the one freewheeling place on, the most freewheeling place on earth because they have this kind of very old school i just listened to an interview with them this old school epidemiologist and infectious disease expert who's running their things and he says there's no science for all of this stuff like these this uh shutting down borders no science um what were the other some of the other things like for the so he he wants hand washing self-isolate if you want we'd like mm-hmm. that but we're not going to police you and no mass gatherings. That's essentially yeah. their model. And so the businesses are open, the bars are open, restaurants are open, everything's open there. So I guess Albertans, all you right-wing Albertans, <laughs> move to Sweden. <laughs> <laughs> you can get there. You can't get a plane. You cannot yeah. get a flight. Okay, um, my last tweet comes from, I don't know, i got to find it here. Jason Kenney, Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. Mm -hmm. This came last night. The the good news. Western Canadian select oil is now trading at negative prices. Down pointing backhand index. Whatever that means. Killing and delaying pipelines landlocked versus COVID-19 collapse demand. The Russian Saudi price war surge supply filling up inventories. The future of hundreds of thousands of, of Canadian jobs is at stake. So Dave, um, in, let me just find this in early in early on February 19th the price of oil was uh 53.49 US and the and of um WCS which is a lot of our oil most of our oil 38 was at $38 US 38.48 a barrel 38.48 and this is what they generally base their budget project projections on the Alberta government Mm-hmm. Um, was on a slightly higher figure than that, actually, when they were trying to gauge world demand. And now it's it's gone from 38 to zero. And um, so I'm working on a piece right now about the economic impacts on Alberta. And it's almost too horrible to contemplate, is the truth, what's happened here. And um, I'd like to be positive, but we are headed... It's not just so there's this worldwide depression coming, according to most forecasters. You look at the IMF and what other people are saying. It's not good. It's very bad. And then that which reduces the the, the, the demand for oil. There was this absolutely ridiculous fight between Saudi Arabia and Russia that, that compounded things. And we are I, I don't know where we're left. And that's what I'm trying to figure out is where we are left in all this. Mm-hmm. But it ain't good. And, uh, you know, I. I was talking to seven of my friends. We all got together on Skype last night and most of them are in business and they're not, they're not happy. And they're just, they're they're. It's, I guess 
they all looked a little they all looked a little bit sad and uh, depressed at this point. Yeah. It's just terrible. Well, it is. It's it's bad news on top of bad news. It's one of those things that you know you knew it was going to get low. You knew it was going to get close to zero, and you knew that um, uh, that there was going to be potential problems ahead for uh, Alberta and Canada related to oil. But you you kind of hoped that it wouldn't get down to where it is now to negative pricing. You kind of hoped it wouldn't get that bad, but I, you know, there's, there's oil that's being produced. They have nowhere to store it. They have nowhere, no way to get it anywhere and nobody wants it. So I don't know. You're right. I try and stay positive. <laughs> I go back to the top of the, the list from earlier that, you know, <laughs> some things aren't on quarantine, positivity and happiness and time with your family. Sigh. <laughs> It just, I, I don't think the reality has sunk into anyone yet. Like, yeah, it's, it's not, we're just hoping beyond hope that things will get back to normal. I think, I think everyone's yeah. secretly, maybe I'm, maybe I'm not, but I think uh, most of us are secretly hoping, yeah, well, we'll just slowly get back to normal and it'll be okay. And, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, that belies the facts of this virus that it comes in waves. Um, it's going to come again. It's, you know, it could be with us, you know, the, har the Harvard, epidemiologist uh, Lip Lipsitch, I think his name is, was talking about it coming, you know, in waves till 2022 and maybe 2024. So it's a very difficult uh, and tough time. And and here's what I would say is that we're all under a ton, ton of stress uh, and everyone's having these huge reactions to everything. But the people who are saying that, you know, everyone has, everyone wants what's best of I just have no doubt about that. I don't think anyone's acting in bad faith here yeah. or trying to kill people or trying to kill the economy on the other hand. Like no one is doing either of those things. And in our commentary and in our dealings with each other, we have, we have to keep that in mind. People are just trying to sort this out, figure it out. There's no, there's no clear answers on the virus. There's no clear answers on the economy. We're going to be mm -hmm. struggling a long time, but to get through it, I think we need a good and healthy and kind debate, maybe a kinder debate than we're used to. And so far, the debate has gotten less kind, I think, um, because people are so on edge. But I think maybe we can pull back from that, and, and I'll, I'll try to do that myself. Sounds good. All right. Thanks, Dave. <laughs> thanks for talking today, Dave. No worries. All right. Until the next time, over and out. <laughs>